We own the night. Chapter 4. The meeting. The sun had already set when Kandra was sitting at the dressing table, looking out through the mirror that reflected the exit to the half-blinded balcony. Pale and hunched over, she waited dutifully while Ellie sorted out her hair and brushed it through. Today was the last preparations before the wedding, exhausting Miss Brightman in addition to her deep sadness. She was very much looking forward and at the same time dreading the impending meeting with James, for it promised to be her last. And even if not, the girl would not wish to show him her anguish and see his pain anyway. Love should bring happiness, not burden. Too bad he wouldn't be able to forget her the way he had forgotten some events from his life in the real world, unless there was a law in Neverland that they didn't know about. A silent tear rolled down her cheek. Kandra hoped it would go unnoticed, but despite her focus on her mistress's hair, the maid glanced at the reflection as well. What is it, my lady? Worried? Only about what sort of life awaits me after the gala. Miss Brightman replied grimly, trying to dry her tears. Oh, don't worry. Commodore Mello will provide you with a comfortable life full of care and lovely surprises. You mentioned that he takes a lot of interest in your hobbies and is very respectful of your personal boundaries. You said that's exactly what the nobility lacks. Ellie chirped as she ran the long strands through the calm. Kandra closed her eyes tiredly and put her fingers to her face. Yes, but he doesn't do it out of the goodness of his heart. He does it out of the will of his mind. He's brought up to do so, and he doesn't really need this. I can see that he finds my looks attractive and my character tolerable and unusual, but he has no heartstrings towards me, and I'm sure he will overstep my personal boundaries as soon as it comes to the wedding night, for it is customary to spend it. She shuddered as she imagined being alone with Alexander after the party. The maid slowed down and looked at her sympathetically. Perhaps he feels out of place in someone else's house and will reveal himself in another way when the two of you begin to live together. Everyone says that Commodore Mello is a man of word and honour with a big heart and a flexible mind. Plus, he's young and good-looking. It would have been far scarier if it had been an ugly old man. She tried to console her mistress, but in fact it only made her more unhappy. I don't care about his dignity in comparison to others, Miss Brightman shouted angrily, pounding the armrest with her fist and staring at Ellie with glistening eyes. I love someone else. She realized what she'd said and instantly regretted it. The surge of emotion left her even more exhausted, and the distinct portrait of James in her mind clutched her throat in a vice. The maid saw her lips and eyelashes quiver and stopped her activity, staring at her in amazement. At last she dropped. Well, that's wonderful, my lady. Why don't you tell Mr. Donovan about it and call off the wedding? Because I can't marry this man. She answered deafly. Why not? Is he from a simple family? No. Is he poor? No, supposedly. Married? No. Then what is it? Ellie kept questioning, staring intently at her mistress for clues, then suddenly groaned and came up with the correct guess. A pirate? Kandra remained silent, rubbing her temple. The maid nodded at her own thoughts, brushing her hair again. I know many people talk about pirate romance, and you are so fond of the sea, myths and freedom, but have you thought about the dangers of living on such a ship? And a man of this profession is subject to even greater dangers than a naval officer. And what would happen if you were arrested for aiding and abetting? I have heard that it happens even to people of your status. She wailed. I'm prepared to face any danger. That's not the problem. Miss Brightman cut off with a sigh. The problem is that he is very far away from here, and there is no way we can be together. He is incapable of leaving that territory, and I am incapable of staying there. It's hard to explain. And even impossible, given that Ellie would never in her life believe her dreams, Neverland and Peter Pan to be real. As a good friend, she still decided to support her mistress and said something about how the noble origin of the Chosen One might mitigate Samuel Donovan's reaction that connections in the diplomatic circle should help get him out of prison or wherever he'd been staying. Kandra listened to her half-heartedly and stopped altogether as soon as she saw a very strange thing in the mirror. A ship with white sails with black pattern was sailing across the completely darkened sky in the starlight.
Her heart skipped a bit and beat it faster. Was she so drowned in grief that she was already beginning to deliriously see one of the desired outcomes in reality? The aristocrat blinked a few times, pinched herself discreetly, but the brick did not disappear and only increased in size, its nose pointing towards her house. Ellie, leave, please! She asked in a voice not her own, which clearly startled the maid. And before she could take a closer look at the reflection, she stood up and led her to the door. My lady, forgive me. I meant no offense. You didn't insult me, don't worry. It's just that I need to be alone. It's urgent. I didn't have time to make the bed for you. That's all right. I can manage. Good night. Miss Brightman realized she couldn't explain her behavior clearly and hoped she wouldn't be interrogated again tomorrow. But the distraught Ellie was quick to leave her thoughts. Locking the door, on cotton legs, she walked to the open balcony. Kandra stared, spellbound, at the approaching ship with a mixture of stupefaction, disbelief and hope, for it had acquired familiar features. The Jolly Roger was descending, slowing and entering a turn, leaving a plume of orange-yellow dust behind it. But it was not even the sight of her beloved vessel cleaving through the air currents like water that interested the girl more, but the figure in the scarlet and gold captain's attire that descended from it, stopped by the railing in two graceful leaps. Captain Hook stood on her balcony, turning his iconic, slightly mocking smile towards her. Seeing that she was too shocked, he spoke first. The carriage from Neverland has arrived, Miss Brightmoon. James, but how did you... Faith, trust in pixie dust, my hearty. He explained contentedly. There's a lovely someone who's taken a great liking to you. I hope you haven't forgotten her. A glowing winged creature came flying happily toward the lady. Asta? She exclaimed, smiling and finally realizing. She returned her gaze to the man, laughed heartily, ran up to him and jumped into his arms. James wrapped her in a tight ring of his arms and even lifted her above the floor, feeling a huge rush of strength. You madman! shouted Condra. You couldn't have simply dropped anchor in a secluded lagoon and sent Aster after me, could you? Didn't you like my entrance? Cook was picturesquely surprised. I show the world wonders. The Jolly Roger deserves to soar over every ship in the Caribbean because she's a legend. He was so carried away by the pompous speech that he let her go and gave an expressive wave of his arms, followed by a charming smile and a purr. Besides, I sneaked onto your balcony like a most exemplary secret lover. Your ship, in the first place, is hovering right in front of the eastern windows of my house. The girl continued to bend her line, resisting his charms for the time being. But she did seem to blush or sound less confident as his smile took on a more predatory character, and he, leaning closer to her face, parried. So what? Who am I here to fear? The sweaty chump Donovan or his simpleton son, or perhaps Commodore Mello? You'll chop him up like a reed yourself after all our training. He was saying one thing, but meant something else entirely. He took hold of her elbow and whispered in her ear. You almost blew my head off. For the first time I felt the danger coming from you so delicate and fragile. And then I really was defeated, for I lost my head because of you. His enveloping voice, his words and the reverent strokes of his fingertips on her bare shoulder ignited an unfamiliar fire in the lady. She could feel his power and the presence of such unbridled force within her was frightening indeed, so she nimbly broke free of his light grip and hurried back to her room, throwing him a cursory remark as she went. I need to pack. James was puzzled by her behavior, but such a challenge only increased his interest in the game and his ambition to win, so he was not confused and said with a nonchalant smile. That won't be necessary. Aster, help the fair Kandra with her luggage, will you? The fairy, who was keenly watching the lovers' dialogue from a distance, did not refuse, flying into the bedroom and into the already open wardrobe, where she was busy packing clothes and shoes into suitcases with the help of magic dust, and Miss Brightman had to watch with amazement as she deftly coped with the transfer of the jewelry box, bottles of perfume and personal hygiene items. 
who cleaned against the door jump amused by her reaction and continued with a deep, slightly husky voice, bending his fingers. Well, what do you say, my beauty? Didn't your hero deserve a kiss? He's negotiated with the fairies, found his way from Neverland to your home, spared you maid's labor. Hmm? He wiggled his eyebrows and looked at her inquiringly. Her cheeks flushed, and it took her a moment to think of an answer. Well, not in front of everyone, she mumbled, glancing up at the ship hovering in the air, the deck of which was covered with the figures of sailors. The captain glanced over his shoulder, paused for a moment to make a decision, smiled with faint guilt, and scratched the tip of his moustache with his hook. Indeed, I'd forgotten all about the rules of decorum. He waited until Asta was outside with the last of her cargo, then crossed the threshold, imperceptibly closed the balcony and curtained it, then turned to the stricken girl and inquired as if nothing had happened. Is that better? But from the outside it looks so... straightforward. Even these mouth-breathers have been smart enough to figure out what the connection is between us. For a long time now, the obvious has no need for secrecy. Are you that startled by my determination? He looked at her questioningly, frowning slightly as if with genuine concern, then moved slowly closer, saying, Or do you not want to kiss me? He crept toward her with the curiosity of a tiger, and an unknowable force bound her so tightly that it was hard to breathe. Kandra could not move, only stare spellbound into the bottomless blue eyes. And see the confusion on your face. Well, let me teach you to hear yourself better. The captain reached out his right hand toward her rather suddenly, and the cold iron sank beneath her jaw. The lady froze completely, and for a moment her soul went to her heels. Though she was certain he would not harm her, he seemed unpredictable to her. The feeling of danger, James said, lowering his voice and arms smoothly does make you lose your head, doesn't it? He was following the movement of the hook along her slender neck, and she was feeling it. The sharp metal outlined every curve, every adrenaline-filled vein, one time tickling like a feather, the other time pressing with as much pressure as was permissible so as not to leave a scratch. Slowly, the captain was studying her body and her reactions, and the girl's skin began to cover in goosebumps. As his hook slid over the dimples of her collarbones, her head felt so light that she involuntarily searched for his other arm, as if afraid to get off the ground and drift off into space somewhere, and he offered to hold him by the sleeve of his coat while his hand dodged the touch, preferring to add some sensation by stroking the back of her hand and wrist with the fingertips. Reaching the end, the iron implement slid a little further to her shoulder and lightly snagged the dress. A sigh rose from Kandra's chest and froze on her parted lips, never coming off. The next second, the hook was in the loop formed under the ribbon, a piece of which adorned the harpsichord in the cabin on the Jolly Roger, and James drew the lady closer. Their foreheads touched, the barely parted lips were literally an inch apart, their hot breaths mingled, but no more than that. The captain chose to run the hook along the outline of her dress neckline, gently cupping it and even pulling it slightly, but his gaze remained fixed on the girl's ruddy face. She didn't know how it worked, but the mere chilling movements of the dangerous object directed by him, the piercing gaze of his darkened eyes and the hot air from his lungs drove her insane. He really made her want to kiss him unbearably, and Kandra had already reached for his lips when he suddenly put the hook behind her back, pried the light fabric with it, almost cutting it, and so pulled the girl away from him against the wall, saying, The lesson is not yet over, Miss Brightmoon. She didn't quite understand exactly what he was trying to do, nor what the rules of the game were, but she couldn't and didn't want to contradict him, intrigued by what was coming next, and therefore even more embarrassed. Hook, on the other hand, expertly stepped up to her and grabbed her by the neck below her jaw, firmly but painlessly. He hadn't smiled since the lesson had begun, 
meticulously dosing his passion and establishing a body-language synergy with the lady, though the element of amusement in what was happening was evident, especially in his phrasing. You were all goosebumps, shivering. Apologies, I touched you with a cold iron. I'll try to warm you up. With that excuse, James began to gently turn her head, lavishing long, soft kisses on her neck with the tickling strokes of his facial hair and the tip of his nose. Contra gasped even louder, embraced him and soon began to put her collarbones, shoulders and cleavage under the scalding touch of his lips. Having gotten approval, the captain added his teeth to them, causing her to flinch, inhale sharply and squeeze the fabric of his coat, but she didn't push him away or try to pull away, and he only had to look into her pleasure-clouded eyes to continue nibbling voluptuously on her delicate skin. Here and there, a drop at a time, spiciness was added to their interaction, and Miss Brightman's composure drained away. Her legs buckled, and James kindly offered her extra support and put not just a knee, but his thigh under her pelvis and pushed her higher, squeezing her in a little. At this point, the lady couldn't take it anymore and moaned before she could think about it. Encouraged, he ran his tone from her cleavage to her shoulder, gripping the fabric of her sleeve with his teeth and leisurely pulling it down to open more room for kisses when suddenly the girl eloquently pressed her palms against him. He paused obediently and met her worried gaze. We are expected. Again, out of an overwhelming sense of embarrassment, the aristocrat found an excuse. Inner Hook rolled his eyes in annoyance and wanted to nail her to the wall more tightly, but James smiled encouragingly, brushed a few strands away from her ear with his iron tool and whispered assurances. Don't worry. I've warned Smee to lead the ship into the sea at dawn if we are delayed. Aster will help us catch up with them. And what if we're heard? Noticing how she flashed all pink at this question, the captain burst into a quiet low laugh. Frankly, it was an approach he hadn't expected from her. And he liked it. <sighs> are you going to make noise? Well, then we can move to my quarters. Some of the crew are already sound asleep. Others will continue to have fun and be busy maintaining the ship. Doesn't sound as embarrassing as a house with cardboard walls with your relatives sleeping behind them, does it? Though Commodore Mello could do with a lesson in courting ladies. James murmured ironically, caressing the area near her ear with his lips. Kandra admittedly didn't need as much explanation. The idea of sharing a bed in her beloved cabin, where the sounds would drown out in the rustle of the waves, the creak of wood and the flapping of sails, and the busy people outside would know about their relationship, had initially appealed to her more, so she only muttered something in agreement, hugging him tighter, and then Hook picked her up and carried her to the balcony. Asta had been peeking through the tiny slit between the curtains the whole time, as she immediately helped him open the door and move to the deck. It looked as if Miss Brightman had fallen asleep, so snug was she in his arms, hiding her blissful face on the captain's broad chest. Mr. Smee, put the Jolly Roger in the water and set a course for Tortuga. We shall look for old acquaintances, gather intelligence as to present circumstances, and prepare for a new chapter in our voyage. Let our sweet fairy regain her strength. The rest of you are dismissed, but remember that the ship is more important than your leisure time. Don't disturb me until morning. The lady must rest. James ordered in an even, firm tone before he strode back to his hiding place. His expression was so severe that even after the men left, the sailors hesitated to giggle over his mysterious disappearances in the company of the young beauty and simply obeyed the order. As expected, the sounds peculiar to the deck of a pirate brig during a voyage began to boil, and the dark, gilded door isolated them almost entirely. A completely awake girl was placed on the scarlet rock. Welcome back, my hearty. Where were we again? Hook was the first to speak, a playful and charming grin on his face. He was curious as to what Kandra would do now, and he didn't wait long for her to answer as she approached him 
and ran her hands through his unruly curls, brushing them away from his face with a fragrance of loveliness. She seemed intent on kissing him, but the captain unprincipledly turned away to remove his hat and place it on the table, conveniently at his side. You're right, I had forgotten about the hat. How rude of me! He commented with feigned seriousness. Then Miss Brightman lowered her hands to his chest, stroking through his hair and neck, and tried again, in an impulse disturbing the edges of his coat, and James dodged again, stepping back and dropping it with a circular motion of his shoulders. Oh yes, and I still had my coat on. Thank you for the tip, my love. He continued, arching his eyebrows amusedly and smiling innocently, and hung his coat on the back of a chair. The lady was enjoying his games, but her inner flame burned so brightly that it burnt out all but one thought. I want to kiss you. It was said with the anguish of passion in her voice that he desired to feel in her, and the captain instantly changed his face. He stopped smiling again and showed her a similar fire in his piercing, predatory, sparkling eyes. Do you know? Then you've learned your lesson. He summed up, raising his chin and spreading his arms, unable to keep from grinning. Come and reward your hero with a kiss, darling princess. Annoyed by his insolence, she confidently approached him, grabbed the edges of his waistcoat and grazed his lips, biting them lightly as punishment. James was so surprised by her behavior that he just froze and exhaled sharply. But Kandra wasted no time in taking advantage of the position of his arms and brushing off the piece of costume she had grabbed onto the floor. The captain saw fit to thank her for her initiative, so he added depth to the kiss and wrapped his right arm around her back, sensually squeezing her thigh with his left hand and pressing her powerfully against him. Then slowly, to avoid tearing, started loosening the lace of her dress with his hook. The aroused girl drowned in the lingering, spicy taste of his lips and stroked his neck and collarbones with rapture, often clutching the lush collar of his silk shirt and eventually untying it. Noticing this, the lady became a little confused and James pulled away slightly, and they both took a breather. He saw her wistfully run her fingers to the end of the triangular neckline, smirked, tilted his head and said sweetly, If you are interested in seeing my body, you'll have to help me take this off. You've shown a lot of zeal before, so I'm sure you can handle it. Ready? The captain lifted the bottom edge of the shirt, looking playfully at Kandra from under his arched eyebrow. She grasped the fabric with both hands, and together they pulled it up. James released his left arm, then his head, and finally the lady carefully pulled down the right sleeve, fortunately wide enough for the hook to pass through it unhindered. And then the captain began to enjoy her reaction to the opening view. His figure was refined rather than massive but visibly toned, with a pronounced waist and chest muscles. The width of his shoulders was brightened by fluffy hair, but his arms looked strong with aristocratically thin wrists. His left shoulder was adorned with a colorful tattoo of fitting scores of arms, while his right was almost entirely hidden beneath a heavy brown leather epaulet with multiple straps securing its position and holding a protective wooden sleeve with a gold tip and an iron hook socket. Watching the mute admiration and hungry sparks in the girl's eyes, James thrusted his chest out and purred. I'm all yours, my hearty, and allow you to explore me not only visually. And she did. Beginning with timid strokes of the firm, heated skin dotted with old fine scars, Kandra went into a frenzy and slid her velvet lips over it, marking the muscles with soft yet eager kisses. The captain had forgotten the last time he had received such caresses, and it seemed to him that they had never been so desirable and disarming, and they seemed particularly heady from Miss Brightman, so beloved and shy. Despite her inexperience, she showed passion vividly when she stopped being afraid, and Hook almost purred with pleasure as he ran his hand over her silky hair in encouragement and gratitude. The girl gradually lowered herself to her knees, making a path all the way down to his trousers, 
and he only watched from above with a satisfied smirk and had absolutely no intention of stopping her. The skin on his stomach was softer, and the lady showered it with particularly sweet kisses, feeling it cover in goosebumps. She moved her palms from his waist to his thighs, stroked them, then her hands moved to their inner sides, which increased the already present tension. Her fingers slid eagerly to the buttons and nervously started undoing them, but that wasn't even the most startling part. Her pretty rosy cheek, rubbed lightly against the area beneath them, causing James to exhale hoarsely, stagger and clutch at the nearby table, flipping his curly mane. He looked at Kandra with a mixture of amazement, delight and arousal, and she, already done with the buttons, suddenly realized what she had done and froze in a terrible embarrassment. He gave her an affectionate smile, tugged at the ribbon of her dress with his hook and said, Don't worry, you're not doing anything shameful, but you don't have to go on. You are a clever girl, my love. Get up. Trust in his soft tone, the girl obeyed, but he was no longer going to slow down. He himself pulled her up by the bow, untying it, grabbed her by the hair, and pulled her gently but demandingly, turning her around and pressing her back against him. The lady wanted to shriek in surprise, but the sharp tip of the hook settled against her throat, and she managed only a muffled moan. Enjoying the power he had over her, James buried his nose into her fragrant strands, reached her ear, and in a hoarse whisper asked, Where would you like to continue, my love? You have the whole cabin to choose from, not just the bed. Literally the whole of it. Kandra was silent, trembling in his arms. She couldn't understand how he could be so different, yet always so determined and seductive, and why she wanted to do as he wished and play by his rules. Her gaze slid to the harpsichord and stopped. Strangely, the lid was down. The captain, who had been watching her intently the whole time, arched his eyebrows in surprise. What a marvelous place. You spoil me, I must say. Before the girl realized it, she was deftly picked up, carried to the musical instrument, and seated on top of it. James stepped back for a few seconds, admiring the view, and said with satisfaction. Yes, this is probably the prettiest corner of my quarters, and the only one even remotely in keeping with your splendor. He ran his hand above her knee and brushed away the hair that had fallen over her face with the hook smiling guiltily, but mostly in anticipation. I am a gentleman, Kandra, but a gentleman of passion. So if you find my actions too pushy, rude, or simply unpleasant, let me know immediately. I want you to feel nothing but pleasure in communicating with my passion. Do we have a deal? Yes, she said, barely audibly, meeting his serious gaze for a moment before she closed her eyes and accepted the first gesture in the form of a tender yet firm kiss. At the time, she had no idea how many times she would cry that word out during the night. James had become the man who had planted a playful little devil in her quiet pool, one who longed endlessly for tactile contact with him and was turned on at the drop of a hat as soon as picked up by a vibe of his charms. His every touch was divine and carried her above the gates of paradise, though her body burned like hellfire, seized by lust as he covered her with confident, devoted kisses, undoing the lace of her dress and gradually pulling it down. He took his time but showed determination, and his dual approach to her was adorable. He did everything to keep Kandra basking and relaxed, surrendering herself to the power of sensations and impulses. She trusted him so much that she wasn't even embarrassed by her nakedness and only exhaled as she hugged his neck. James, please. Please what? Do this to me. Do what? Take me. Your word is law, my lady. All he needed was to make sure she was ready, and besides, he liked to hear her ask for more passion. He moved closer to her already spread thighs and gently embraced her waist. His attentive gaze focused on her face and full of concern and desire to make her feel good, 
and his palm stroked with encouragement and support. He made the ultimate contact with her with all care, giving her enough time to get used to the new experience and trying to nullify the painful sensations. They didn't frighten the girl. Her eyes glowed with love, her hands squeezed his muscular shoulders and her body pulled towards him. The captain started slowly and smoothly, not letting animal instincts override his empathy for her, prioritizing her desires and only changing anything when she hinted at it or asked for it directly. He made her feel that her boundaries, opinions and fantasies mattered enormously, and yet he controlled what was happening and by his actions bent her to advantageous impulses, without malice, of course, just subconsciously. Consumed by the fire of passion, floating in clouds of pleasure and thrown to the bottom of the abyss of unconditional love, Kandra was curving and rubbing against him as her body overflowed with emotions, moaning and screaming as they were escaping, fervently returning his hungry kisses and bites and turning his meticulously styled hair into total mess ecstatically calling his name as if it were the most beautiful word on earth and begging him to continue and conquer her with all the harshness of Captain Hook. Perfection had just taken on direct meaning for them and they wrote the most explicit love song using the harpsichord in a very non-trivial way. It stoically endured the humiliation, then shook and squeaked its legs and ended up with a scratch from the hook that had been stuck into it as the song ended with a loud, uneven chord accompanied by a gentle melodic flute and a hoarsely growling double bass. The Jolly Roger had long since descended into the water, but it seemed to them that they had soared even higher than the portal to Neverland, somewhere beyond the edge of the universe. The lady stretched out on the lid of the musical instrument in sweet exhaustion, pressed into it by the weight of the captain's body, with its sides billowing heavily and frequently, under which her frail figure was not at all visible. Good heavens, Kandra, you are perfect. He exhaled hotly, and with a remnant of passion he closed his teeth on her earlobe, caressing her thigh with his hand. Miss Brightman mumbled unintelligibly, squinting her eyes shut and scratching the back of his neck. Having recovered his breath, James put his other arm behind her back and pulled her toward him, straightening up and lifting her off the harpsichord. The girl hugged him and snuggled against him, almost like a sleepy child in a parent's arms, and he carried her to an appropriate place, the bed. He reverently laid her on the sheets, matching the color of the cabin decorations, and snuggled beside her. Are you sure you want to run away with me? He asked, watching in adoration as she rubbed her nose against his chest, wrapped her arm around him and moved as close to him as she could. Even to the end of the world or back to Neverland, I won't let you go again, my James. The lady declared, tickling him with her lips. The captain chuckled and hugged her back, glancing out the windows. Dawn was breaking. And you won't evaporate with the first ray of sunlight. There it is already, and you're still here. He suddenly realized how happy he was and did not immediately notice how his vision blurred due to the tears shuddering in his eyes. The first tears of pure joy in his life. And always will be. I'm with you, James. The girl whispered softly. He took a deep breath, suppressing unnecessary emotion, and turned his head toward her. I love you, Kendra. He said directly what he'd been unable to say the whole time they'd known each other, and left a soft kiss on the top of her head. Now rest. The Jolly Roger held her curse for Tatuga, and Kandra stopped hating daytime, for she knew that she would now wake up next to her beloved Captain James Cook.